at our meetings not long ago, last year I believe, or maybe the year before, he was in our field meeting, and he's going to talk about uh, pest management, water quality, and how thoughtful, and get on a little bit on this, uh, some of the key pests with uh, uh, targeted uh, with uh, floors we have to work. So, Dan, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Pete, and uh, I appreciate the uh, previous speakers. I'd, I'd like to reiterate that uh, Laura's Band is actually a pretty important uh, uh, tool for alfalfa production that we've had for many years, and uh, we would certainly hate to see it uh, as a loss to growers, and, and there is a, but there is a significant uh, water quality problem that we need to look at, and also I think there are mitigation measures that can be used. Is there a remote on this, Pete? Uh, no, it's the space one. Okay. Uh, okay, so those of you who are not familiar with alfalfa, it's uh, one of the top crops in, in uh, California. It's, uh, uh, 2011 is 1.7 billion. Uh, the key, though, about it, uh, this crop is that it actually is related to several other important uh, crops. Um, oh, I have to go backwards now. I don't know how to do that. Okay, so. Uh, it's related primarily to the dairy industry, of course, and cattle and calves, uh, which uh, actually combined is about 29% uh, of the agricultural value in California, if you think about, about them as a food producing system. So it's actually not a small crop. Uh, I don't know if this is a bragging right issue here, or it's also the uh, top water user in California, about 19% of the agricultural water, and, and actually all forages, uh, have a pretty large uh, water imprint in California, well over 25% probably if you put them together, which means that uh, alfalfa itself has a, uh, an important role on the water quality side as well as the water quantity side, and they're actually interrelated issues, so, so it's important to think of them together. Oftentimes people don't recognize where alfalfa is in their own food system and something that we have to uh, uh, remind them. One of the things I wanted to uh, point out is that there are lots of uh, environmental services that can be attributed to, to alfalfa, particularly on the soil side, reducing nitrogen fertilizer needs, absorbing nitrates from depth. And I think the, one of the earlier um, speakers talked about how we're going to be uh, really in a position in agriculture of trying to manage nitrogen much more effectively than we have in the past. And, and alfalfa actually could be a solution to some of these issues, insectary for biological diversity, habitat for wildlife and so forth. And, um, and so one of the things I'd like to suggest is that uh, could alfalfa be some of the solutions to some of these water quality problems and not just a water quality uh, uh, generator of problems itself. So it does, it can contribute to significantly to improve water quality because it essentially is a grass waterway. Uh, you know, uh, water coming in a, into an alfalfa field can often be cleaned up. But uh, we know that there are some water quality problems, which I'm going to talk about here today. Uh, <laughs> it's also a crop that's actually ideal for an integrated pest management approach. In why? This is a perennial crop. A large number of beneficials are living in alfalfa fields. It can withstand some damage without, uh, uh, because the economic thresholds are not as near as they are with a seed or a fruit producing uh, crop. And it has a long history of research uh, uh, in, in California. In fact, many of the principles, uh, uh, Pete tells me, were developed in alfalfa originally. It was one of the first ones that they developed an IPM guide at UC Davis. One of the major pests, and here I want to make sure that we're thinking about not just uh, insects, but also weeds. Uh, we, weeds are probably our number one pest uh, across the board in alfalfa production systems. Uh, winter weed complex, uh, broadleaves, weeds mostly. Uh, we also have a group of aggressive summer weeds that might be both uh, broadleaf and grasses that come into play. And so there's basically two opportunities in established alfalfa fields uh, for weed intrusion. Um, we also have an intrusion of perennial weeds or, or very specific weeds like daughter, which come into play in, in alfalfa fields. We use herbicides routinely for stand establishment and also in established alfalfa fields. Uh, stand establishment is probably the most important place where herbicides have a big fit. And, and so uh, herbicides certainly are an issue. The major uh, insect pests in alfalfa are alfalfa weevil, uh, which comes as pretty reliable pests. I don't know if you should call a pest reliable, but if, if there is a reliable pest, alfalfa weevil or Egyptian alfalfa weevil is, is pretty reliable pests throughout California, really, 
uh, from the low deserts of near Mexico all the way up to the inner mountain area of California, we see alfalfa weevil pretty much every year. Uh, an aphid complex, which is more uh, spotty depending upon where you are, uh, but uh, these are a whole series of, of aphids that can uh, uh, be found in alfalfa fields, oftentimes occurring with the weevils, but sometimes not too, sometimes at other times of the year. And uh, this, another uh, basically major uh, uh, pest uh, complex is what we call the summer worm complex, which includes alfalfa caterpillar, um, uh, bead armyworm, western striped armyworm, and other types of worms, the lepidopter insect pests that usually occur uh, in, even together in, in alfalfa fields from about June all the way through the fall. And so these are our major insect pests. We do have uh, outbreaks of other sort of special pests like uh, cutworms or uh, clover root curculio or other types of pests that do occur occasionally. But these are our major ones. Alfalfa, Egyptian alfalfa weevil uh, complex starts off as an egg, in the, uh, usually late in the, in the fall or late fall in the stems, uh, emerges in the early part of the spring as a larvae and uh, generates uh, basically one generation a year. Uh, if it chews the leaves of alfalfa pretty voraciously, the larval stage is really the dangerous stage of this pest and then uh, flies off as an adult uh, to uh, estivate during the summer period of time and start the whole cycle over again in the fall. And so um, this, like I say, is, uh, is one that we see pretty much every year. Uh, the aphid complex, uh, we have um, uh, some resistant cultivars to certainly spotted and blue alfalfa aphids. Um, we do have uh, resistant varieties uh, for these pests. Not too good of a resistant for uh, a pea aphid, but, uh, and none really for cow pea aphid, although some of the seed companies are, are trying to develop some resistant cultivars. One of the things that you may not be aware of is that actually alfalfa has more pest resistant uh, characteristics, insect diseases, and nematodes than pretty much any other crop plant. And you can have a listing of those uh, resistance ratings on my website at UC Davis and also in other published uh, forums. So these occur uh, many times of the year. Um, you see they're differentiated. Uh, uh, sometimes you need a, uh, an entomologist to, to ask about some of these uh, insect pests. Now pea aphids are actually pretty distinctive because they're very, very black. Uh, pea aphid and blue aphid are sometimes difficult to tell apart. Uh, the uh, summer worm complex includes the bee armyworm, worm, western yellow stripe armyworm, worm, and alfalfa caterpillar, which are the butterflies that you see flying around and smashing against your windshield if you're driving through an alfalfa area. Um, alfalfa caterpillar is relatively easy to kill uh, with, say, BT, uh, but the army worms are more difficult. Uh, BT is uh, less effective and it's more difficult to kill um, than, than some of the other Lepidoptera. Um, this is a chart from uh, the IPM website showing the uh, uh, basically year-long uh, occurrence of these pests. The alfalfa weevil comes in the very early part of the year, pretty much ends in April. Central Valley a little bit later, in a mountain area a little bit later. Um, pea aphid, uh, again in the spring, but also in the late part of the year. Uh, the different aphids occur actually at different times of the year. The cowpea aphid actually can be at many different times of the year. You've seen it as late as midsummer, mid to late summer. Army worms, though, are basically a warm season uh, type of insect pest that come in in the late part of the year. Leaf hoppers, which I didn't mention because they're a much more localized type of uh, pest. Nationally, actually, leaf hoppers, uh, potato leaf hopper is probably one of our most important insect pests in alfalfa, but in California, for the most part, it's, it's more localized. Uh, we do have problems in the low uh, part of the Central Valley and the desert regions with leaf hoppers. What are the insecticides used in alfalfa? Well, we uh, really depend, this is from the pesticide use database. Uh, Clopyrifos or Lorsman is uh, probably the largest. Uh, we do have a, a lot of steward coming into play. Um, enough weight, uh, again, in Oak Key. Um, and some of the uh, pyrethroids have actually had substantial acreage. I couldn't find the acreage for some of these, uh, some of these other pesticides on the pesticide use database. So, so we're treating well over a million acres of cropland 
every year with, uh, with an insecticide. In fact, this is probably a little low. We have about 950,000 acres in, in California of alfalfa currently. And, um, and so it's usually about 1.4 applications per acre on the average in California. And you can see that chlorpyrifos is really our number one uh, tool that we use in this crop. <coughs> we estimate that maybe 75% of our fields are treated annually for alfalfa weevil and probably 46% of fields are treated for summer worms. So if you look at Pete's graphs over here on the wall, you can see two big peaks here, chlorpyrifos in the early part of the year. Uh, its use is very, very high. And then another peak later in the year. And so that really makes a lot of sense with these two large uh, periods of time that we're concerned about pests. The aphids and miscellaneous pests are more uh, spotty in terms of where they occur throughout the year. Um, herbicides, and I think it's actually important that we think about pest management not just as uh, insecticides and herbicides, but an entire crop management process. <coughs> Here are some of the major uh, herbicide use in alfalfa. It's actually probably incomplete as well. We have a few more that are not included in this chart. Um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, we, we do use herbicides routinely in alfalfa, and we have several. Uh, Hexazinon and Diuron, which have been uh, cited as being important for water quality issues. And we, we're actually in some counties that are restricted because of their, uh, their showing up in groundwater or surface water. So we need to be concerned about these. The Delta region in particular, where we have uh, some issues with some of these uh, herbicides. So what are the key water quality issues with this crop? First of all, OP pesticides are probably our number one with surface waters. And the problem with OP pesticides in areas where alfalfa is being grown is number one, uh, they're detected at parts per trillion in some of the uh, 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 tests that are being done. You can detect them in parts per trillion. And one of the um, growers asked me, well, give me a sense of what a part per trillion is. And we calculated it out. It's a few drops of some of substance in a single irrigation in an 80 acre field. And so that get, kind of gives you a sense of what a part per trillion is. It's a pretty low amount. And they're toxic at that, at that quantity, maybe 20 to 30 uh, parts per trillion. Sediment movement is also an issue with alfalfa, but it's fairly minor because it is such an effective uh, crop at keeping sediment in fields. But it's important on the tail ends of fields. And I think this is one thing that you need to pay attention to. Pyrethroids primarily move with the sediments or other kinds of particulates that are in the mm -hmm. field, uh, leaf fragments, and so forth. And so um, we're, I think pyrethroids, to some degree, represent a solution to some of our uh, issues, although uh, we have to be careful about movement of sediment even on alfalfa fields. And Belpar and Carmex have been also identified in some of the monitoring that's been done. Uh, remember that all growers must farm on the requirement of ground <coughs> surface and groundwater. And for those of you, you know, I, I guess the question is, you, know, you can well, you can discuss this issue as a regulatory issue, but the Clean Water Act was passed, I believe, with the unanimous uh, consent of both houses of Congress back in the 70s. That, and I don't know if, uh, uh, if, if our regulatory folks would uh, back me up on that, but I think that's correct that it was passed with uh, both houses. Now, how often does that happen, you know? And so it's, it's something that, that it's, it's gonna be there. Soil erosion generally is a very positive thing with alfalfa. It's one of the best crops for holding soils in place. It prevents both wind and water erosion, but we do have some erosion taking place on the tail ends of fields. And uh, that is, most of the fields are actually pretty good, but then if you have uh, water exiting fields, the particulates in the ditches or the small little uh, drainage areas, or even on the tail ends of fields where it deteriorates, I think are, are where we see a particulate problem with, with, with alfalfa. And this is some data on sediment sampling that was done in Yellow County <coughs> to long. And where sediment was high, uh, you can see the tailwaters were much lower than the sediment uh, uh, 
measurements in, in the, this is the source water and this is the tail water. So source water, tail water, and so forth. So you can see here, there's plenty of evidence here that where, where you see high rates of sedimentation in the source water, alfalfa cleans those fields up pretty nicely. However, that doesn't mean that we're off the hook because on the tail ends of alfalfa fields, we see plenty of opportunities for erosion. And I think this is an opportunity for growers to mitigate the off-site movement of pesticides by preventing those ditches from moving sediment off of these fields. Uh, reminding you that actually um, pyrethroid insecticides by large are adhered very tightly to soil particles. And so they will move primarily as a function of sediment movement, not in the, in the dissolved in the water. At least that's my understanding of the chemistry. Uh, pesticide impacts in, ten, in, in alfalfa in general is pretty positive, but we have these problems with, with OP pesticides. And the reason I say it's positive, we probably have one of the lowest pesticide intensities of many crops. It's in the pounds of AI applied per acre. In fact, strawberries goes so far off the chart you can't even see it. And that's been primarily because of uh, some of the practices in, uh, in strawberries. Uh, but in terms of uh, acres treated, alfalfa is pretty high. And this is some old data, but cotton was much higher at that point in time. And in terms of chlorpyrifos, we're one of the largest players in California. In fact, I think now we're currently the largest player in California. So uh, organophosphates are a big deal with, our, with this crop. And yes, OP pesticides move off of alfalfa fields. This was some data from Yellow County where Rachel Long majored about 30 fields and split them down the middle, uh, applying pyrethroids to one half of those fields and OP pesticides to the other half. And she found virtually 100% toxicity in every single field. So that was a pretty, pretty strong data set that, that showed you there was one field that maybe just not quite as muddled, but uh, essentially all of these fields had very little toxicity in the pyrethroid treated fields. And I think that I would cautiously say that pyrethroids are one of the solutions or one of the mitigating uh, factors for if, if a grower cannot have water moving off or if they can't help but having water moving off of their fields to look at pyrethroids. But at the same time, you've got to be careful about the sedimentation issue with the pyrethroids and also some of the negative IPM implications of pyrethroids, which tend to uh, have, have give, be kind of hard on beneficials, I think. So those are some of the things that uh, we have to be aware of. So here are some of the exceedances for chlorpyrifos, which uh, were a few years ago, and they continue to be an issue in some of the uh, monitoring that's been done. Felpar is also a key issue for controlling ground salt, and it has been detected in wells, and it's something we should be aware of with alfalfa. It's a small situation, but it's something we've got to be aware of. Um, it's less than drinking water standards, but uh, nobody likes to have uh, herbicides in their well. Again, again, surface water may be this culprit, and other than perhaps on sandy soils. The, the integrated principle here is water management. And the hard part in alfalfa is trying to figure out how to manage uh, uh, these types of runoff situations, uh, particularly in areas like in the northern San Joaquin Valley, in the Delta region, and the Sacramento Valley, where surface runoff is really an, an issue. I want to point out that actually vast, there's at least 50% of our alfalfa fields in California probably have very little surface runoff. And one of the things when you begin to think about these issues of pesticide uh, contamination issues and, and environmental issues is to sort of divide this up into a smaller problem. So if you have 50% of our fields that really do not have significant amount of runoff, and that really uh, lowers the, uh, the potential areas where we can mitigate these kinds of problems. So what are the key mit mitigation uh, measures? And I won't go into these in huge detail. I have some more detail if you're interested in, in this. But the key issue is water management. And I've, I've gone so far to say to growers that are near sloughs and, and waterways that are waters of the state, in quotations, um, Essentially, you're going to have a hard time preventing <coughs> runoff of floors van in those, in those fields. We don't recommend you using them in those fields where water will be running off those fields. Uh, we also need to look at 
better methods of tail end management, tail water management at the end of alfalfa fields uh, to prevent, and in some cases, can, other ways that growers can change their irrigation systems that completely prevent water from moving off those fields. And that's the kind of question we need to ask ourselves. There are some mitigation measures in terms of switching uh, chemicals, <coughs> softer chemicals, including pyrethroids, but other chemicals as well. In alfalfa, that makes some sense if you can prevent particulates from moving off these fields or keep them from overspraying uh, waterways. Um, and softer chemistries, uh, different kinds of uh, uh, softer uh, on the environment chemicals that are not as readily uh, soluble in water. Remember that not all fields have off-site water movement, and so we have to, uh, again, keep that in mind when we're thinking about mitigation measures. One of the things I'd like to suggest is uh, to turn this around a little bit. If we're thinking about a farm and the way in which that farm, the water on that farm moves around from field to field, and when water moves from a, one field to another, um, and uh, I guess the question is, before that water enters public waters, can you utilize alfalfa fields as essentially a filter strip on those watershed areas um, itself? In other words, to, to clean up uh, a ranch or a watershed region, um, depending upon how the piping on that particular ranch works. And so these are some of the mitigation measures that we've explored with growers. So key points here, let's think of ways to make alfalfa a solution to water quality problems, particularly you know, we see a lot of row crops where it's really hard to prevent erosion in some of these row crops, where you have water moving off of row crop fields uh, through alfalfa fields before they get into drainage ditches. Uh, again, we have a, a real advantage here. Alfalfa takes up somewhere between 300 and 800 pounds of nitrogen per year, and a lot, and that can be uh, taken up from nitrate in the, in the water. One of the really important points that we try to point out to regulators is that there is really no one-size-fits-all mitigation measure for some of these issues. It tends to be highly site-specific, and the integration of many practices probably are, are appropriate when, when it comes to uh, figuring out ways to, to mitigate these impacts of uh, uh, pesticides um, in, in uh, this crop. So with that, I guess uh, open it up for discussion or question. By the way, uh, uh, the rule is that you cannot throw tomatoes if you don't like what I have to say. Um, but uh, you can throw hay bales. Hay bales are okay, but but, 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 tomatoes, you, but you prefer 